Welcome to the second of two webinars to discover resources to support your GLOBE student research during the 2024-2025 school year and prepare students to enter their projects into the 2025 GLOBE International Virtual Science Symposium. These webinars will feature subject matter experts sharing their research, the type of GLOBE data it generates, and examples of research questions that your kids can answer and explore using this data. You may hear science activation or SciAct and wonder what that means. These projects are part of a cooperative network of competitively selected teams from across the nation working with NASA infrastructure activities to share NASA science with learners of all ages. And if you're wondering if we're recording, yes, we are. And the information on IVSS can be found on the link here and it will be referenced later on. And there is a playlist of all the supported webinars for the 2025 IBSS at the link. Please be sure to share these resources with your colleagues and any information to them. As you know, this is a Zoom webinar and the best way to get your questions answered would be to either use the chat or the Q&A option because we have subject matter experts that are online and able to answer your questions in real time. So please feel free to type at any time. At the end of each presenter's presentation, if you have questions, we can pause for that before we move to the next one. Tonight, we'll hear from subject matter experts and scientists on My NASA Data, Globe Snow X, Globe Mission Mosquito, Globe Eclipse, and then Globe Land Cover and Trees. I'll turn it over to Allison for the explanation of IVSS. Thanks, Allison. Right. Thanks, Cassie, for organizing. And thank you. It's an honor to be on this webinar with all of these distinguished presenters. And so I am Allison Mote, and I am an education specialist with the Globe Implementation Office. And one of the big projects I manage is the International Virtual Science Symposium. So I'm going to give you just a really high level overview, and then I'll put some additional information in the in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. But the IVSS, you can see that there's a banner on the slide here that shows our theme with some images of students in their IVSS projects from last year. But the theme for this year's IVSS is 30 years of GLOBE, understanding the past, present, and future. And for those who aren't familiar, it's an online symposium for students who are engaged in scientific research, collecting data, following GLOBE protocols. It's an opportunity for those students to share their research with STEM professionals and the GLOBE community. The benefit to students is that, of course, they get to engage in the scientific process and conducting their own research, but they also get really valuable feedback on their work from judges who volunteer their time to score and provide feedback from all over the world. So this is a really cool opportunity for students to get that feedback. And the IVSS is open to students at all grade levels from K or primary grade levels through undergraduate and college. So K through 16. And projects are scored using rubrics by different grade levels. Next slide, Next slide please. And one of the really cool things about the IVSS is that students have the opportunity to showcase the scientific and engineering practices that they engage with while conducting their research. So on the screen now, I've got all of the different virtual badges that, that students have the opportunity to earn. The one in the middle is really a spotlight because all students who submit projects that are scored by our judges, so they, they meet the criteria for our projects, they earn the student researcher badge. In addition to that, students have the opportunity to apply for up to three additional badges so they can showcase their data scientist skills, which I'll talk about in just a minute, or they might showcase an engineering solution to a problem they're investigating. So there are a lot of opportunities for students to sort of think through their, their scientific process and apply for additional badges. Next slide, please. And so the project requirements, in order to make it to the judging process, students need to include a, a written report, uh, which includes an abstract or summary. And then that research report is a written research report. And we've got guidelines on our website for different grade levels and what the requirements are. 
Students should also include an explanation for each badge that they are hoping to earn and a presentation. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then in addition to that, if any photos or images of students or adults appear in the project or presentation, they also need to include a photo release form. Next slide, please. And so presentation examples are shown on the screen here. Really the goal of the presentation is for students to creatively communicate their science. So you can see some student researchers here presenting a scientific poster to some, some judges. And so the, the options for presentations are a, a digital poster. They might also record their presentation. So doing a screen screencast or narrated presentation. And if they do that, they'll need to include a video link that is viewable, it's accessible to a public audience. Or another option is an ArcGIS story map. So those provide really creative ways for students to display their scientific research. So we have guidelines and templates for different presentation types on the IVSS student research resources page. I'll drop that link in the chat in just, uh, just a minute. Next slide, please. And so each year, all students, all student projects who are scored and earn the highest rating on their work. So that's a four star rating and projects that also earn two additional badges. And this year we're, we're requiring that students earn the I am a data scientist badge can be entered into a drawing to receive a stipend. And so Students who receive stipends can use those funds, student teams can use those funds to help offset the cost of attending the GLOBE annual meeting student experience. I've got some screen, some images on the right side of the screen of students at the GLOBE annual meeting student experience from this past summer. And this is a really unique opportunity for students to present their research to GLOBE community members, which includes educators, scientists, STEM professionals, and also their peers from around the world. So they present their research. They also engage in a field, a field program where they do, you do different GLOBE protocols and investigations in the field and engage with scientists from, from all over the world. So it's a really unique and exciting opportunity for students to be able to engage with other student researchers and scientists. And this year, the GLOBE annual meeting will be held in July this summer. And so tonight we're highlighting, and, and this year we're highlighting the data scientist theme badge, and our presenters are going to be talking about how students can use various types of GLOBE data in their projects. But as I mentioned, we are asking that students earn the data scientist badge for their IVSS projects in order to be entered into the Earth Day stipend this year. And for that badge, we're asking that students include an in-depth analysis of data downloaded from the GLOBE database, as well as their own data sources if they are co collecting new data. So with that, we've got more guidelines on the badges page of our website, but we're asking that students discuss limitations of the data, use data to make inferences about past, present, or future events, or use the data to answer questions or solve problems in the represented system. Next slide, please. And so this webinar is so exciting because our presenters are going to talk about how different um, examples of research questions and different types of GLOBE data. But some other suggestions to go along with that, you know, students can really be creative with how they use GLOBE data. They can use the data to develop an understanding of Earth system processes as they're kind of developing their research questions. They might also use it to develop their hypotheses and formulate their research questions to develop their explanations or um, you know, we can, they can also explore GLOBE data from any time period or region. So I've got a screenshot of the GLOBE visualization system, one way students can access data on the bottom right, on the bottom left side of the screen. Um, there might not be GLOBE data in your specific region and that's perfectly fine. So students can explore or compare data from different latitudes, maybe that are similar to yours from different regions. Uh, really the possibilities are endless. And um, they can also compare GLOBE data collected in the past to newly collected data. Collecting new data is not a requirement, but we definitely encourage that. Next slide, please. 
And so there's a QR code on the screen to learn more. I'll also put the link to our website in the, in the chat here. So please, you'll see on the left side of, of the screen there, we've got some quick links with more information about badges, report requirements. And then we've also got some recorded webinars on the IVSS page at the bottom under the timeline, which goes into more detail about um, just the, the IVSS requirements. So please check it out and feel free to email me if you have any questions and I'll put my, my email in the chat as well. But thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing um, from our presenters. Thanks, Cassie. Thank you very much, Allison. I appreciate it. Our first presenter is Desiree, and she'll be, she with, along with Angie Rizzi, prepared this My NASA data video. And Desiree will be available after the end if you have any questions or during her presentation, type them right into the chat. Hello, my name is Angie Rizzi, and I'm the task lead for MyNASA Data. We have a data visualization tool called the Earth System Data Explorer that allows you to look at over 60 Earth science data sets. While we do not have globe data, you can use our Earth science data to provide background information for your globe investigations. You can look at historical data to see what is normal, or you can compare different variables. If you use historical GLOBE data that you can download from the GLOBE visualization tool, you can also download data from MyNASA data and compare it with your GLOBE data. The rest of this video is a tutorial on how to use the MyNASA data Earth System Data Explorer visualization tool. Desiree Wilson, the developer of the tool, will walk you through how to use the different features. Remember, this can enhance your GLOBE data, but not replace it. My name is Desiree Wilson. Today, we're going to learn how to get started with the Earth System Data Explorer 2.0, the data visualization tool provided by MyNASA Data. On the Earth System Data Explorer 2.0, you will find collections of Earth science data, primarily collected via satellite and from NASA sources. We'll demonstrate the primary features of loading data for a particular time and location exploring the data with identify, generating a time plot, analyzing data with compare to, and exporting information. When you launch the Earth System Data Explorer, you will see a data set selection panel on the left and a blank map on the right. If we go to the top left-hand corner of our screen, we are first instructed to select a sphere of the Earth system. These are the atmosphere, biosphere, cryosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere. For this tutorial, we will select the atmosphere. Next, we will select the Earth Science category of the data set. We will focus on the category of temperature. Next, we will select a data set, the monthly surface air temperature data set. Lastly, we will select a date. We will select 2023 and then select January. Immediately upon selecting the data set month, the data will load onto the map and a legend will appear in the top left-hand panel. The legend contains the date, the units, the color bar, a plain language description of the data set, and the source of the data. At any time, you may change your map selection by revisiting any of the steps in the data selection process. You can change the location on the map in several different ways. You may pan around by clicking and dragging and zoom in and out by scrolling. You may also use the plus and minus symbols in the left-hand corner of the map to zoom in and out. Alternatively, you can search for a specific region or location by using the search bar above the map. You'll also notice that a new panel has loaded on the right side of the screen. This panel includes different analysis tools. The time plot analysis tool allows you to create and view a plot of how the data changes over time in one location. To demonstrate this, we'll select the time plot button. Once selected, instructions for how to create a time plot will appear in the right panel. We are first instructed to select a location. This can be done either by selecting a location on the map or entering in the latitude and longitude. If you decide to enter in the latitude and longitude manually, 
Note that the latitude must be entered as a number between negative 90 and positive 90, and the longitude must be entered as a number between negative 180 and positive 180. Once you have selected a location, you will be prompted to select the start and end date for your time plot. I'm going to select several years worth of data. We'll say from 2019 to 2022. When you have finished your selections, you must click the Generate Plot button to load the plot. This will generate a time plot for the location and dates you selected. As you can see, the map remains at the bottom and a point has been added to indicate your chosen location for the time plot. You may also enlarge the time plot to do this, click the small square button in the right-hand corner of your chart. This will open and enlarge the chart in a new window in your browser. In this view, you now have the option to download the data as a SVG or PNG file. Next, we will return to the main window. To close the time plot instructions, we will scroll down and select the Exit Time Plot button. The plot is then removed and then we can select a different analysis tool. Next, we will show you how you can compare two different data sets on a map with the Compare To feature. After clicking the Compare To button, you will see that a slider and a blank right map has been added, while the air temperature data in Legend remains on the left side. The data set selection instructions are now shown in the right panel and are used to load data on the right map. These instructions are the same as the instructions on the left. I will select the same monthly surface air temperature data set, but during a summer month instead of a winter month. You will see that a new legend appears on the right representing the data for the right map. Now we can move the slider back and forth to compare the two different dates. When you are finished using the Compare To tool, we can press the Exit Compare To button at the bottom of the panel. The Compare feature is then removed and we can select from the different analysis tools again. Next, we will show you how you can view the data value for a location on the map using the Identify tool. After clicking the Identify button, the instructions will appear in the right panel. We are instructed to select a location on the map. After selecting the location, the data value will now appear in the right panel, along with the location's latitude and longitude. When we select a different location, the information will update in the panel. To exit the Identify tool and return to the main menu, select the Exit Identify button. And this is ENG Rizzi with some updated features. You can download in a couple of ways. To get the map image, you can click the Generate Download Image button and then download the map. Or you can download data as a CSV file for a given location. To do this, click the Data Table button and you will enter your location as you have done before and then put your starting and ending dates as you do when you make a time plot. Once you select those dates, click the Generate Data Table button and it will come up. If you expand the table with the little window at the top right, the table will come up and the Download CSV button will be on the top right. Thank you very much for joining us. And if you'd like to learn more about my NASA data's offerings, please visit mynasadata.lark.nasa.gov or visit our other tutorials at our YouTube channel. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks, Desiree. And I know Angie's not here, but you'll pass that along for us. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat for her. Next is Globe. Alaska with NASA SnowX, and I'm so excited to share Christy Buffington and Julia White, their video, so. I'm Julia, and this is me climbing on the Root Glacier in Alaska's wrangell St. Elias National Park. I am a master's student in the Earth System Science Program at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I'm here today because I'm also a NASA SnowX intern, starting to use GLOBE for my research. I hope that you will start your GLOBE research along with me. I'm Christy, also at University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm a GLOBE educator and trainer, and I'm one of Julia's mentors. 
The grant, Global Alaska and NASA SNOWX Reciprocal Mentoring and Collaboration, makes this work possible. In the next few minutes, we'll share my path to becoming a NASA intern and why I'm researching snow. I'll also demonstrate how to collect globe, snow, and land cover data and later find it on the GLOBE website. Here's me and all of the people helping me with my internship. One thing I'd like to point out is that these logos represent people and projects collaborating with me. They are also interested in you and your GLOBE investigations. Dr. Carrie Voyevich is both the lead scientist for the NASA SNOWX project and my NASA mentor. About a year before this photo was taken on the Root Glacier, I wandered up to Alaska to spend the summer in the Alaska Range, and I decided to stay and finish my undergraduate degree at UAF. And while pursuing a degree in Arctic and Northern Studies, I wanted to learn more about the places where I spend so much time, but I was also hesitant because I didn't have a traditional science background. And I quickly learned that asking questions opens doors. I reached out to a scientist, Dr. Simon Zwieback, about his spruce beetle lab and later his permafrost lab called the Ground Ice Project. I got jobs working on field campaigns, GIS, and remote sensing. And GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, and remote sensing involves using devices such as satellites to measure features like snow on the Earth. I then became an intern at Alaska Satellite Facility, where I helped create remote sensing and GIS courses. You too could be a NASA intern. My advice to students of all ages is to get outside, be curious, and ask questions. SNOWX is a multi-year experiment sponsored by NASA. It uses different snow remote sensing technologies alongside participants who observe snow on the ground. The red dots are SNOWX locations where data has been collected. The legend shows landscape types called snow classes. In Alaska, this includes tundra and boreal forest. So it's windy in the, Alas in the Alaska range and wind moves snow around. I'm wondering if I can measure the snow depth and snow drifts from the ground and from remote sensing technologies. Since snow drifts hold water, I also want to find out how much water they hold. I can do that with snow depth data and some additional information about the snow. According to a research study in the Alaska Arctic by Parr, Sturm, and Larsen, 40% of snow water equivalent in a region is contained in snow drifts, and almost 20% of the region had drifts. I'm curious about your research questions and how you interact with snow drifts. Maybe one forms in the schoolyard every year. What do you notice? Globe and SnowX are interested in the role that snow plays in your life. Just like you, in my NASA internship, I am working towards earning Globe badges, such as I am a collaborator and I am an Earth System Scientist. I'm also earning an Earth System Science graduate degree. To answer my research question about snowdrifts, I need to collaborate with people in remote areas, such as dog mushers and students with snowdrifts near their school. Researching snowdrifts requires use of the globe atmosphere snow protocols and the globe observer land cover app as well as satellite remote sensing data everything is interconnected let's talk about how to collect globe snow data in land cover photos to collect and enter globe snow depth data use a meter stick to measure depth in millimeters in three places that are without drifts we'll talk about the drift data later the other thing i have to do before i collect my snow sample is to get the snow depth. So I'm gonna get this measurement in three places. 410 millimeters, 381, 372. GLOBE can help answer Julia's second research question, how much water is in the snow drift? This is the GLOBE precipitation gauge. You can use it for both rain and for snow. If you use it for snow, you collect snow using the outer gauge. You bring it inside to melt it, and then you pour it in the funnel, and the funnel then constricts and goes into this inner tube. And the inner tube is marked with the depth of the liquid water equivalent in millimeters. So Kayla Bannister collected snow in this outer tube and then took it inside melted it, and then found out how much liquid water was in that column of snow. We'll demonstrate here. I'm going to go ahead and pour into 
the funnel and into the inner tube. Stop there. And then I will read the number on the gauge. And I poured to 16 millimeters or 16 millimeters depth of snow. So sometimes people can be confused because this looks a lot taller than 16 millimeters. And I'll show what this actually means. If I were to melt that snow and pour it into this outer tube and then measure it with a ruler, the depth of the snow is 1.6 centimeters or 16 millimeters. To answer Julia's question about depth of snowdrifts, we would use the Globe Observer app and the land cover tool. When taking a feature photo using Globe Observer land cover, add the depth of the drift in millimeters to the caption. NASA SnowX scientist Dr. Kiri Voyevich also uses the Globe Observer app. She has precipitation, snow depth, cloud observations, all under the Globe Atmosphere protocols. Under land cover, you can see pictures from the snow pit sites from up, down, in each cardinal direction. So how do we find these snow depth and land cover photos in the Globe Visualization System? We have to select snowpack depth under atmosphere protocols and land cover photos under biosphere protocols and then click the submit button. I pulled these data from the Fairbanks, Alaska area. There's SnowX data alongside student data. Clicking on these dots would give you snow depth and land cover photos. I like that you can also export all of the data into Excel for analysis. We'd love to know what your snow research questions are. The best way to contact Julia or me, Christy, is by sending either of us an email. Let's get outside. We'll see you in the snow. That was amazing. If there are any questions for Christy or Julia, they're available now and in the chat. I know you might need to think about some of them, but that was amazing. Thank you, Julia, for sharing your journey to your to your place where you are now. Of and course, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to learn and collaborate. I, I really appreciate it. Awesome. And thank you to Christy, too. I have learned so much from Christy, and it's been really great to have her as a mentor. From Globe Mission Mosquito. Hi, I'm Rusty Lowe, and today Cassie, Sophie, and I are going to talk about some project ideas that you might be able to do using your Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper data. The most important thing to remember is that when you make your observations about mosquitoes using this tool, just remember that every time you make a surveil, you, you, I, you look at mosquitoes, you find mosquitoes, and you dump out mosquito habitats, you're actually making a contribution to reducing the risk of disease locally. So that's really important. But today we're going to talk about the data that you collect and how that data can be used. And you're going to be collecting data using the Globe Observer data, Citizen Science Data Collection Tool. It takes you through all the steps of collecting data from identifying where you find the water, taking a picture of those sites, sampling the mosquitoes that you find, and then taking pictures of those mosquitoes. And you just do that step by step in the app. But once you do that, you suddenly have material that you can use for research projects. And I'm going to talk uh, mostly about the data, but I want to say if you're working with younger students or if you are a younger student, you can do some really interesting experimental studies by walking around your community and identifying where mosquitoes are located, what kind of containers 
Do you find them? You can also make some mosquito traps and you can compare and contrast where mosquitoes are found. So there's lots of experimental projects you can do. But because this year is 30 years of data, that's our theme for the IVSS, and we want people to reach out and use data, that's what I want to talk about today for our older students. And we have some ideas for research questions. You can go through these on your own. But basically, you can answer any question you want about the ecology of mosquitoes, the kind of environment that they prefer to be in, and how these different conditions change over time with respect to how many mosquitoes you find and what kind of mosquitoes you find. So take a look at some of these different questions. But we have some tools already available to you where you can actually explore this on your own. And these are called the Mosquito Protocol Bundles, and they're located on the GLOBE website. And what the bundle does is it provides you with the information you need to connect the mosquito observations that you're making using the citizen science tool with atmosphere, hydrosphere, pedosphere, or biosphere measurements that are found in the GLOBE database. So you can, all the background that you need is in the bundle. You can start by looking at the relevant scientific background that gives you a lot of background. There you can also find some questions and ideas for projects, and you'll be able then to move forward with your research. Besides using GLOBE data, we also encourage you to think about using some satellite data. And we're really lucky because my NASA data and the location is, is um, identified here below, they have gone ahead and identified different kinds of data sets that they serve up that you can look at that relate to the mosquito protocol. So the mosquito protocol is identified here in light blue, and you could look at any one of those or more than one of those and compare and contrast the, the graphs by graphing the data, and then you can see whether or not there is a relationship. So that is a really nice way of looking at data and comparing it and coming up with some conclusions about what is important for the mosquitoes in your area. Okay, I wanna thank you for your attention. And I think Cassie's gonna talk a little bit more about some materials that we have to help you understand more about mosquitoes. Cassie. Thanks, Rusty. The GLOBE Mission Mosquito webpage has lots of information and resources. So stop and check it out at the following link. More on this later. Not sure you know enough about mosquito biology or their habitats? Don't worry, we've got you covered with the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunter's Guide. It's under Resources. Just scroll down a bit. The power of this resource as a learning and teaching tool is its flexibility. It's in a Google slide format, so there's a variety of ways to use it. From displaying it on a whiteboard to downloading and having the kids work independently with it. It can be done in a classroom setting and an after-school science club. It could be done in a homeschool setting and in formal venue. Ultimately, is providing an engaging pathway to learning the biology and the behaviors of mosquitoes and building confidence in using the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool. This guide follows a logical, instructional, and learning sequence. Let's take a look at the table of contents. This series of 26 short activities is designed for upper elementary through middle school and will actively guide your students from understanding what a mosquito is, to finding and observing them. And we haven't forgotten to supply the answer keys and more. The activities culminate with a thrilling detective activity, Mosquito Larva Hunters 1 and 2. You'll learn all about your three prime mosquito larvae targets. And at the end, if you pass the bug shot lineup, you will earn badges and share your accomplishments. You can use or view the Larva Hunter's Guide in Google Slides, save or download it to your own editable copy in Google Docs as a PDF or as a PowerPoint file. As a facilitator, you're not alone. We've developed a comprehensive facilitator's guide that includes detailed explanation, answers, and strategies for use and citizen science connections. We've even addressed a few common mosquito misconceptions, such as 
Do all mosquitoes bite? And does a mosquito die after biting a human? The sections are all hyperlinked and you can jump to the pages with the answers first or to the explanations. And this is what a full page would look like in the facilitator's guide. We have the goal of the activity, a summary, and then how to facilitate it. We even give you an idea of how long the activity will take, what the learners will do, why they will do it, and what can you do to support their learning. So back to the GLOBE Mission Mosquito page. There are over 3,500 species of mosquitoes and only a small percent carry and spread disease. The Culex pipiens is a common disease spreader in the United States and it's commonly called the northern house mosquito. In the United States, it's known to spread West Nile virus. After using the Mission Mosquito Larva Hunter's Guide, you'll know that many factors combine to provide a favorable habitat for this species. Two of these factors are temperature and precipitation. These mosquitoes need temperatures that are warm enough to promote breeding and survival, and the Culex pipiens need temperatures at or above 12 and a half degrees Celsius to emerge and to show up for the season. They also require enough precipitation to provide water for the mosquitoes' eggs to mature into larvae. Your students can play an important role in finding artificial container or breeding sites and then dumping the water within. Unusually high rainfall creates new breeding sites where none existed before. Unusually low rainfall can change habitats that can concentrate water into small pools where there had previously been flowing water, all of which can potentially increase the proportion of container breeding sites. Hurricanes or droughts both provide new and unique places for mosquitoes to breed. NASA data that would be useful in an investigation includes that found in the mosquito bundle land cover classification, that's the land cover changes, land surface, the water and the land uses and the ecosystems, precipitation, that would be the breeding ground areas, soil moisture such as vegetation and seasonal changes, and land surface temperature, global warming and urban heat island and the weather and the seasons. Scientists use temperature and precipitation data to help predict mosquito populations. And using the Mosquito Bundle and the Globe Visor ADAT, your students can investigate average monthly precipitation and temperature for your location. If there isn't Globe data available in your area, consider expanding your research area. A variation in latitude can influence the local climate and consequently mosquito populations. If you're looking for additional resources, here in the Mission Mosquito Resource section, you'll find the two that I talked about earlier, the Larva Hunter's Guide and the Facilitator's Guide. The appropriate badges, a mosquito identification key, the mechanics of a mosquito bite, how to do some mosquito research, conduct your own mosquito habitat survey, and then games that you can play, mosquito habitats and hideouts, mosquito tellers, get to know your mosquitoes, and then a Beyond the Bite where we take a deep dive into the diseases that mosquitoes carry. Thank you very much and if you have any questions be sure to contact Dr. Rusty Lowe or myself. And next up is Globe Eclipse with Kristen Weaver. Hi, my name is Kristen Weaver and I'm the Deputy Coordinator for the Globe Observer Team based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And along with Marley Colin Robles from the Globe Clouds team at NASA Langley Research Center, we co-led the, the Globe Eclipse efforts for the Observer Team for the past eclipses, the annular solar eclipse in October 2023 and the total solar eclipse in April of this year. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the data that's available from the eclipses and some of the things you might think about as possible research or exploration topics for your International Virtual Science Symposium projects. 
So the basic idea behind the eclipse data is that the sun is solar powered and the sun drives a lot of processes in the atmosphere. And so having the sun blocked during an eclipse, even though it's only a short period of time comparatively, can potentially have an impact on clouds, on air temperature, on winds, on all of these processes in the atmosphere. And so that's what we wanted people to collect data about during the eclipses. So we're talking about data collection from the ground, but of course we can also see this from satellite data. So this is a kind of neat visualization here. This is from the GOES-16 satellite. The data is from NOAA. And you can see as the shadow passes across, this is the Yucatan Peninsula in October of 2023, so the annular eclipse, and I'll have it repeat a few times here. You can actually see some of these clouds dissipate. And that's one of the things we would anticipate looking for as one of the possible impacts of an eclipse eclipse is the sun's not heating the surface as much so there's less convection so there might be less formation of certain types of clouds and we actually have a globe observer connect session with Marle Colon Robles and Ashley Atori talking about this this is available on our observer website if you want more information and they also wrote up a nice blog about the topic so that could be a good place to do some background research in general what we asked people to do was collect data using the globe observer app we had people use the land cover tool to document the, land, document the landscape and hopefully include their thermometer in one photo. So that sort of sets the scene for the data collection. Then we also asked people to observe clouds every 15 to 30 minutes or any time they saw a change in the clouds. And then we also asked people to get a thermometer and record the air temperature every five to 10 minutes for two hours before and after maximum eclipse. So that's what we were asking people to collect in terms of data. And what you can see here is a, an example of a data setup. This is happened to be where I was during the eclipse. So that's my graph of air temperature on the left and then the cloud percentage at the bottom. And then in the middle there, you can kind of see my, my setup, this grassy area where I was observing. I had a Kestrel weather station and then some of my cloud observations on the right. This is just one example of what it might have looked like for somebody collecting data. But of course, that would vary depending on where people were across the US. And this was, the again, the April 2024 eclipse. So this just shows, I mean, in addition to Globe schools and teachers, as well as interested in individuals, we had different folks collecting data for us. On, on the left hand there is the setup from a meteorologist, Jeremy Lewin, who was observing the eclipse from a boat off the coast of Mazatlan in Mexico. I, I have a little bit more about him in a, little, in a second. We also had a bunch of libraries. We had some Texas Master Naturalists. We had the Civil Air Patrol teams collecting data in every state, the District of Colombia and Puerto Rico as part of their solar eclipse mission. So really it was a huge effort in terms of getting data collected all across the country and even in other countries. So um, the this is just an interesting note about this meteorologist. You can see there he set the picture of his setup on, on the ship. And then on the right is the data maps. I just think this is kind of fun because he was probably one of the first data points we got during the eclipse because he was off the coast of, of, of Mazatlan, Mexico. And so you can see those first data points from the past of totality that we have in the GLOBE database, almost certainly the first observations we got. So in terms of the data collected, this is the data we have from April 2024. And we had, as of July, we had almost 7,000 cloud observations in the database, over 32,000 air temperature data points, 631 land cover observations. So this was the total eclipse in April of 2024. But we also have available in the database data from past eclipses. So you can see at the top there, 2017, we really got a lot of data during that eclipse. It was more like over 80 thousand air temperature measurements and I think about 20,000 cloud observations. We didn't have land cover available at that point. Down below that, you can see air temperature and clouds for eclipses in South America in July of 2019 and December of 2020. Those were a little bit of sparser of data sets, uh, but we did get some data during those eclipses. And then on the right, you see the annular eclipse from uh, October. And so there we have air temperature, clouds, and land cover for that one. So this is just a little bit about the data that's available in the database for the eclipses. And again, the primary data was air temperature and clouds with land cover from the more recent ones. But we also had some weather stations collecting wind data. So that might be something that would be of interest. There are also some folks collecting surface temperature. So just in terms of ideas, you could do 
comparisons between different eclipses. You could look at how much the temperature dropped at different locations based on land cover types or altitude or cloud cover or some other factor you're interested in. You could pull data sets from other places for relative humidity. Some of that's going to be in the GLOBE database as well. So there's lots of different variables that you might, might look at. Maybe comparing locations that experience the annular and the total eclipse either in 2023 and 2024 or 2017 and 2023. There's there's some different possibilities. Uh, I think just the idea is try to come up with some factors, some variables that, that you might be able to compare that this data set would that would be in the GLOBE data set that would look at the eclipse effect on the atmosphere and think about the variables that are collected in GLOBE and some of the interesting scientific questions that you might look at in this period when the sun's light is blocked temporarily by the eclipse. And I will also note that, of course, you can get data from the uh, Advanced Data Access Tool, the Globe Visualization System, the API, all of those to pull the data. We do have also some curated data sets for some of the eclipses that are available on our Observer website, and that's observer.globe.gov slash get dash data slash eclipse dash data. So we have some of those curated data sets where it's already pulled out in a spreadsheet for you to download. So I hope this is helpful. I hope this gives you some ideas of some projects you might think about using related to eclipses and the International Virtual Science Symposium. Good luck and enjoy. Here are the emails for myself and for Allison, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. But we hope we provided you with examples of data sources and how to use GLOBE data, questions that your kids maybe could answer using current data that they're collecting in addition to the millions of data points that are available in the GLOBE database.